Okay, good day, people. So, uh, Matt, thou art that, posted up a video called Ontological Creativity, and that was a response to me kind of continuing this discussion on ontology and what is meant there. And I guess I will just start by apologizing if this is overly academic. It's not intended to be. I'm trying to keep it, I guess, as clear and as lucid as I can, and I'm also trying to give as many grounded examples as I can. Okay, so... Let me see if I can't further clarify some of the things I've said, and then I'm going to see if I can't give a shout-out here to this book called Aping Mankind by Raymond Tallis on Neuromania, Darwinitis, and the Misrepresentation of Humanity. And that's, I think, maybe going to help clarify even further some of these concerns. Okay, the first thing. When I say that the epistemological paradigm is post-Cartesian, part of what I mean is this. I mean, Descartes' famous dictum was, I think, therefore I am. Just take that expression, I think, therefore I am. He basically is making it seem, and many people don't realize it, it's very subtle, but he's making it seem as if being is contingent upon thought about being, as if you couldn't be unless you know that you are. But the, they're different phenomena. There, that being is always presupposed in knowing that if I know, I have to know about what is in however it is, but it's not as if knowing is the primary relationship to what is. Okay, and this is why when I say that more people who have been trained in continental philosophy maybe don't have as much difficulty of this, is you want to see the 20th century as two of the most significant books from the continental perspective are Being in Time and Being in Nothingness. Heidegger's Being in Time is not, you know, it's not called Knowledge in Time, it's not called Knowing in Time, it's about Being. And the same with, with Sartre. I mean, when Sartre does Being in Nothingness, it's it's an attempt at ontology. You know, my mentor, Experience in Being, Cal Schrag, who wrote Experience in Being, writes a great book, um, wonderful introduction to continental philosophy and, I guess, to fundamental ontology, right? That's what the book is about. It's about being. Okay. I think a, a totally different way to come at this, let's see if I can tone down some of the, the metaphysical, ontological speculation about, you know, conditions of being and all this. Let's just go to the hand, okay? The hand. The hand is really the key here, okay? Now, and I, for present purposes of this video, I'm not saying that the hand is the crucial to everything, but the hand really, the hand signifies a kind of pre-thematized intelligibility in the world that isn't yet epistemic, but is grounded in disclosures that aren't properly, you know, warranted truth claims. They're disclosures of the world in the articulate gestures that the hand make possible. So let's get at the hand first. Okay. And this some of this really comes so well in, in Raymond Tallis's work. And let me say this real, i got to digress for a moment. You know, there's a couple of videos recently posted on Daniel Dennett's stuff, sort of Dennett talking, both Dennett being interviewed, Dennett giving a lecture, and he takes some stabs at Talis. I can tell because Talis, you know, really picks on Dennett, you know, pretty significantly. And there's one part where, where Dennett's talking about language acquisition. Now, okay, let me say this. Both Dennett and Talis are very good on the problem of agency. Both of them are suggesting that too many people in the scientific community have just unproblematically, uncritically accepted something like a blanket determinism, and it's much more problematic than that. It, the issues are much more sophisticated, and both Dennett and Talis, I think, are trying to carve out a space in which we can understand how agency occurs. For Dennett, it comes down to these, you know, micro agencies that are sort of distributed through the brain in modules, maybe all the way down to the neuronal level, right? I mean, they'll get the actual neurons or little agents competing with one another in order to create further levels of agency as it, as it builds upward or something like this. Whereas Talus, Talus isn't interested in that kind of neuromania, right? And so let me further this out a little bit. So there's a part where um, Dennett's being interviewed and he's talking about chimps and he says, you know, that we realize now that chimps are only, you know, 1% genetic difference. That's all it is. And again, you see this sort of um, 
again, it's, it's, it's a Darwinitis and a neuromania. And Talus is not against um, general understandings of evolution. I mean, he's an atheistic naturalist. He's, he's interested in evolutionary theory, but he's not interested in radical reduction of everything to what had survival value, as if it was passed on by the genes. Okay, so he's much more interested in cultural development of problems. Okay, so at any rate, Dennett's there, he's being interviewed, and Dennett says, you know, chimps are only 1% difference, and he says, you know, look at language acquisition. And he starts to talk about how humans just spontaneously pick up the language without any formal instruction, without any, you know, actual work in trying to get them to be interested in the sounds. If they're around people who speak and they're interacting with them, they just somewhat spontaneously, you know, pick up the language. Chimps, on the other hand, he says, you know, there are hundreds of them who've been sort of sequestered. They're surrounded by words all the time, and they're, they're attempted, you know, people attempt to give them formal instruction to teach them, and there's been very limited success. But all said and done, the chimps just don't seem to be that interested in the sounds as sounds. I mean, it's like, as he says, it's like rustling, uh, the, the leaves are just rustling in the backdrop, that the sounds are there, but they can't ignite the kind of intentional interest that seems to be there for the human. And he says, this is Dennett, Dennett says, well, I can imagine, you know, that we're going to learn more about genes and you're just going to flip a couple of switches and suddenly this chimp is going to become very interested in the sounds and in language. And there it is. Dennett makes it seem, and this is, it's very much out of cognitive science. It's out of the attempts to, to design intelligence Right? And, and part of it has to do with, you know, do, do we really think it's intelligence? See, I think maybe that's part of the issue, Matt. I'm not fully convinced that it is intelligence that, human ha that humans have. It may be creativity, and that's why I like, you know, your, your statement of creativity. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Okay, so, again, Dennett makes it seem as if language acquisition is going to be an issue of a genetic switch being turned on that's going to act activate a kind of intentional interest in the sounds, as if it's happening at the genetic level. Now, Talis, he's much more in line with so many of the arguments I've been trying to give. What Talis is going to go is going to say, well, look, you have to understand the pivotal role played by the hand in evolutionary history. And so it's part of evolution, but it's not simply ev evolutionary survival value passed on by genes. It has to do with the construction of public objects through the agentive function of the hands. So let's talk about the hand first. The hand is unique in the biological world. The hand is unique. And particularly the opposable thumb. The opposable thumb introduces possibilities of both all of the digits being integrated into a unity, and yet they're a hierarchical relationship among the elements. It is, it's one thing to lose a pinky, I don't think anyone wants to lose one, but to lose a thumb is a significant loss. I mean, you have a, a real hardship, right, if suddenly you lose your, your thumb, because your hand is a very sensitive, it has pre-thematized comprehensions. Again, it's not epistemic properly, but you can grope and feel around with your hand in ways that it has a precast intelligibility to it that's more than simply touch and sensation. So, you know, Talis gives the example, if I, I pull my shoulder, if I put my shoulder up and I touch my arm onto my shoulder, I can have it felt in both ways. I can both feel my shoulder with my hand, but I can use my shoulder to feel my hand, right? Again, my hand can feel my shoulder or my shoulder can feel my hand. But as the hand is feeling the shoulder, it's so much more articulate in its movement. It stabilizes part of itself while the other parts move. It has independent hierarchical movements that are already registering a kind of agency. Hands, they are they're the precursor to a kind of agency, and they're the precursor to the kinds of capacities that had to already be in play for language and language acquisition to take root. And so, okay, so we don't have any evidence about the origin of language, but I think most scholars are going to put it somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000. You do have some anthropologists, I think Jared Diamond will place it back as far as a million. Now, tool use goes back 2.5 million. 2.5. Fire use goes back a million, right? When you start to ask 
how were hands part of the way that people created and sculpted the world? Now, again, I want to get into this, this the, the specific ways that the hands relate. Okay, so instead of asking a question like, how does an organism relate to its environment, which I think is, it's a, it's a common strategy, and you know, it's one that I've used even in my own work. I think sometimes we'll say, you know, an, an organism is related to its environment, a human is related to its world, and humans open to an expanse of world because of language, because of symbolic practices, because of culture and history. That's more than just what the senses give. And we sometimes talk about that. We talk about the the particular sensory apparatus by which an organism opens to its surrounding environment. But part of the problem is that we're underestimating the various levels and the forms of self-relation that then get bundled up and then projected outward. Again, go back to the hand. It's not the question of how does the hand relate to the environment. It's how do the fingers relate to one another. The entire hand then relate to my arm and my body. And then things like hand-eye coordination. So there's bundles of forms of self-relation that are an agentative function. They're creative in their capacities to mold and shape the world. And when you think about hands and all of the different varieties they have in terms of their movement, and their gestures, and then you think of all of the different kinds of objects in the world, different sizes, different shapes, different configurations, and it's as if hands themselves are a pre-thematized register of agentative action. That is, you can make decisions about how to hold something, whether to turn your hand this way, whether to lift it that way, whether to grasp on top or whether to hold it a different way. That is, the, the sheer range of possibilities in articulate gestures within the hand are its own form of agency already there. And evolutionarily what happened was people created objects. And okay, so let's go to this, you know. And, and Talis has a book, he has an early book on conversations with Heidegger, but you can see this sort of Heideggerian in, influence on some of Talis' work. And especially like think of something like being in time. You know, when Heidegger talks about the being of non docile beings, right? When he's talking about the kind of being that shows itself to Dasein, in, in your Dasein, to the clearing of being, that that non docile beings show themselves in his two terms, right? Are readiness to hand and presence at hand. That somehow relationship to hands is part of the way the world has been opened up and made manifest and cleared to people. It's not just abstract knowing. So we go back to the Dennett, you know. When Dennett says a few genetic switches are all that's going to be required for the chimps to suddenly be interested in language, you want to go, wait a second, are the genetic switches going to also bring opposable thumbs and introduce the kind of freewheeling manipulatability that humans have? See, I think this is part of the, the problem that I have with the dolphin arguments, that are dolphins very intelligent? Yes, but they're not creative in the way that we are. And it's this creativity that I think is really the issue, that we create objects, we, we interact with the world in pre-thematized agentative waves. They're, they're liberating a, a certain amount of judiciousness, a certain amount of I don't know, of decision-making, of, of capacity for choice, but it's not necessarily consciously reflected upon and then thought about and then justified by various claims, by, by speech warrants. Um, let me see if I can get at this a little bit further, and then I'll let it go, right? And I, I really enjoyed your video, Matt, and I hope that some of this, this makes sense more, right? The, the issue of hands and how hands are part of the world. I mean, right now, look around your room. I, everyone who's watching this video, take a moment and look around wherever you're watching this video and ask yourself how many of the things that you can see right now were made by hands and how many of them are made for hands. See, when I wrote my first book, it was my dissertation, I talked a lot about the world being by hands, for hands. And when you look around, so much of the world. Now, we could say, well, now they're made by automation, but it was hands that made those tools, that made the automated, you know, those, those machines that now produce the world that we live in, 
right? The world is largely a made world. It's a world that's been made through hands. And I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting, you know, literally. And again, this is where Dennett becomes very interesting, right? Dennett, he's a smart guy, and I like him as a resource and an ally regarding the problems of determinism and, you know, what he calls the varieties of free will worth wanting, all this. But he's, he's really... He sort of talked himself into a silly corner. I mean, anybody who follows Dennett's stuff, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not critical of it. I, I think it's sort of ironic. He is so many times in so many places, he does the same argument, which I, I wonder if other people notice it, that he says, you know, it's obvious to him that there was no top-down design. It's obvious to him that intelligence emerged out of nature. There isn't a designer. There was no creator, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, I'm going to show that there's no mystery. I'm going to demonstrate that consciousness can be understood and fully explained by reverse engineering and creating consciousness. So he's, he's caught with this very odd position where he's going to prove that consciousness wasn't created and couldn't have been created because he's going to create some. It's really bizarre, the argument that he's pushed himself into. At any rate, the way that I would come at this issue of intelligence and creativity, and this is, um, it came from a video where I was watching uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, again, I have a great amount of respect for. He's a brilliant guy. He was talking about genetic differences between humans and chimps, and he said that the, the chimp only has about 1% genetic difference. And look at the intelligence difference between us and the chimp and the kind of radical accomplishments we've been able to do with art and science and literature and everything else. And then the sort of, I don't know, the, the standstill evolution, I guess, the non-cultural growth, the sort of non-cultural explosion that you see in like chimp culture or, or the chimp uh, in chimp life. And he says, now we can try to imagine comparatively an alien species that is very similar to us, perhaps only 1% genetically different, and imagine how superior an intellect it could be. And it was a great thought pump. I thought, wow, you know, that's, that is pretty good stuff. You can really imagine how a little bit really goes a, a long way, and this tiny difference could make all the difference in the world. Another part of me was thinking, hmm... I'm not sure if I buy the original definition of is it intelligence? Are we in fact the most intelligent of organisms? I don't know. I think there are certain criteria that we have constructed that would like us to believe that we are and maybe you know growth and life expectancy and all these kinds of things that we've done are are evidences of it, but maybe maybe we're the most creative of primates. Maybe we're the most imaginative. And maybe, some of this gets really crazy, maybe literacy was a kind of communicable disease that was transmitted. It, 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 the infection, the original infection occurred about 2,000 years ago in Greece. And it, Greece was a dirty little seaport and had all kinds of different languages and different writing systems. And then WAPO, the you know, the alphabet was discovered, the, the sub-syllabic fragment was identified, and the condition of universal translation occurred. Science became possible through alphabetacy, through alphabetic literacy, and all the orderliness that it brought. Now, it, was it an intelligence? I don't know. Like I say, it could have been a kind of communicable disease, a, a creativity and an imaginativeness that was that was harnessed into the alphabet, right? And the alphabet gave it a kind of rigor and an orderliness that made it look like it was a supreme kind of intelligence and put people on a track for investigating the, the orderliness that could be pursued by alphabetacy and numeracy, right? The problem, though, is what if none of this is sustainable? What if all of this is like a self-relating organism's bubble fantasy over intelligence? I mean, it could well be that other organisms, if what we mean by intelligence is long-term sustainability, it may be that other organisms are far, far superior to humanity. Humanity was a, a kind of experiment in capacities 
the hand, the upright posture, the, the extended gaze, all these different elements that made way then for language. And then when language was, I don't know, perverted, liberated, constrained and enabled into literate forms, a real revolution occurred, a real transformation in consciousness occurred. And, you know, it may well be that, again, none of this is sustainable and that the, the way that this creative, powerful, world-shaping organism emerged, it, it will destroy itself. It, it will inevitably eat out other ecological niches until it just, you know, undermines its own capacity to, to go on. And even look at, you know, the rise of pharmacological science, right? It's huge. The number of drugs being advertised on a daily basis for every little thing that ails you. And yet, when you hear there's, you know, some particular ailment, and then the big list of all of these side effects, right? You're going to have bleeding eyes, and your ears are going to ring, and your arms may fall off, and, you know, it causes sudden death, and whooping cough, and blah, blah, blah. You go... Do people really understand what they're doing, or are they tinkering in piecemeal fashion? Have they broken the world? They've, they've cracked the cosmic egg. It's in fragments now, and now they're trying piecemeal to put it all back together. When you hear the contemporary physicists openly admit how little we really know, how little we really understand what all of this is, how much things like dark matter, dark energy just they're at the very cusp of beginning to say, these are things we're going to have to try to learn more about. It's not like anybody's going, oh yeah, here's what all this is. I mean, what does it even mean to speak about parallel universes? And we might say, well, these are things that have all been implied by the mathematics. Our mathematics demonstrate these. How do we know that it isn't just a kind of creative tautology? How do we know that it isn't a self-relating bubble that's being projected outward? I don't think we do. Uh, I don't think that that means that there isn't life, that there isn't intelligence, that there isn't, um, I guess, the natural emergence of consciousness in the cosmos. I mean, I think one can argue that the cosmos is orderly and principled in just such a way that life couldn't have not happened and that consciousness is a bouquet that given enough time of life naturally sort of comes off of that. Uh, but I think, you know, part of the problem that I have with epistemic claims is that they, they make it seem as if it all boils down to a, a justified truth claim. And I'm not sure if, if we're really there. I think the things that you're raising about ontological creativity and the degree to which we're agents and how do we account for that agentative function, it certainly is language, but could language have been made way for without the capacities of world making articulate gestures in our hands? I don't know. Uh, but hands, right, we think with our hands and by our hands and through our hands. We don't just know about our hands. If we do know about our hands, it's our hands that enable in a mindless way that knowing about. That is, when you're writing and when you're typing, you can't really consciously know about those processes as they're incorporated into the larger knowing. Again, hands are something we know with and by. We don't just know about our hands. Thanks.